go. Hi, Margo. Welcome to the sisterhood. This is so fun for me to have you on. Thank you, Krista. I think about the, when I started putting this together, I thought about watching you in the classroom when you were student teaching. And of all the sessions I've ever, ever seen, you know, all those observations I've done, I still remember. I still remember that day. I remember walking out in front of the um, the high school afterwards and you saying, how did I do? And um, I don't know if you remember what we, what I said at that point, but I still can remember the words in your response. And that's been a long time ago. Do you remember me? I don't remember what you said. I said, one of the issues about being a really good teacher and extremely talented is that if you're not careful, you'll do all the work and the kids become the spectators. And so now all you have to do is reach within yourself and stop short and let them do the work. Um, I think it's hard to be a presenter or a teacher when you are so talented. I mean, you can take the stage, you can sing, you can dance, you can do whatever. And what we want is for those watching to do the work, to do the interaction. It was fun. I, you, you had a wonderful lesson. It was really fun. Well, we that's put really, it on stage. that's interesting because <laughs> that's really what we're talking about today, you know, is exactly what you just said. But why don't you give people your background and you worked with adolescents for a really long time. So tell us, tell us your history. Uh, I'll try to be short on this. So cut me off because, um, I do have a, you know, you look back all the way back when you're starting to put together your bio and your, and update things. Um, I, I came, I was raised in California. I had two older brothers who um, taught me every day what I needed to know for my own good. I was constantly, constantly um, guarded and opened up and, and told what to do. And then they were very involved teenagers. Then I came to Whitworth as a sophomore. I had gone to the University of California for two years, came to Whitworth, never left, stayed 40 years. Um, I did teach for a five-year stint in a middle school in the Spokane area and absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. They're very funny. They mean to be funny and they're funny when they're not funny. And so the classroom was full of humor and I was delighted. I went back to Whitworth to get my advanced degree and never left. I ended up working in the undergraduate and the graduate program. In the graduate program, I created the Center for Gifted Education and Professional Development. And that started my in-services and presentations and traveling around giving sessions. It also very quickly kind of melded in doing also businesses and the health field because I could do a short talk on dealing with future skills you need, being creative, um, and that kind of spilled over there, though I didn't have maybe the, the educational background. And that's what I did. And, um, and my, my, my job, I retired, and the center was awarded a wonderful foundation. Um, the local supporters donated a million dollars for a um, endowment for gifted ed at Whitworth so that it would never end, which is made it so they now remember me. I would have left and never thought of again, <laughs> except for this. <laughs> this well, and then you, you worked on endowment, which you worked on a state made. level. You've worked on a state level as well. With, I was in uh, yes, gifted I was and talented, in the, uh, director program for the state level, worked with that. And I traveled all over. Actually, when you are a presenter and you're available, which happens when you are teaching college, you have more gift time. Um, I, did, I did keynotes and, and uh, work sessions with businesses and all sorts of things during those years, which was um, a lot of fun. Just, I like to have fun. I like to, I like to have fun. I like to see interaction with people and I like them to deal with, with challenging issues and dealing with the future or as now with the present is definitely a challenge. 
And we need to do that seriously. And we need to do it intentionally. My favorite word is intentional. We need to do intentionally. And we need to have a lot of fun with each other while we do that. So if people walk away from a class, um, if kids walk away from a class or a session and they say, I learned something um, and I had a lot of fun and I feel like I can do it, uh, that's your goal. That's my goal. And it was a wonderful career. And I tried to give in services daily to my husband because we're retired together. I try to make him a better person and I found it not <laughs> nearly as rewarding, but it's pretty funny. Well, so Marco, let's dive into the topic today. We're talking about um, this trend that they're seeing nationally, and a lot of experts are talking about it, but that kids really have more opportunity than they've ever had. They have higher test scores. They have really high grades. They're, real, they're super high achievers coming out of high school. More opportunity. They're starting club sports earlier, all of these things. But then there's a trend that when they hit the college years, they're floundering. What's going on? Um, you've actually got a wonderful summary. We, our kids are achieving. I mean, we have students, and, and remember my focus area is gifted. And that's gifted in all areas, whether it's in their academics or their sport life or, you know, organizational systems, being elected to offices, you know, being in the leadership, we have absolutely great kids. And they respond to that. And what's happened is when they are out on their own, which the first time they're often on their own is to be a college freshman, the first time they hit a bump, a speed bump of a low grade or a, a test score, or they're not happy, they don't know what to do about it. And so the literature that's coming out, and I make a lot of reference in this session to this book, which I want you to know about. And it's called, I hope I don't have it upside down. It's called The Stressed Years of Their Lives, Helping Students Survive and Thrive During Their College Years. When we hit the speed bump is usually the freshman year. The reason I love the book is that it, it, I have taught social, emotional characteristics and needs of the gifted for years. I've given out many lists of these are the social, emotional abilities we'd like our kids to have. But I've never, and I've never find, found one that is as good as this book. And so what I do with the book is I back up and I say, if my youngster is going to need these skills, and the skills are, they're very, they're described, they're not unusual, but they're, and they're in a great sequence. It starts with consciousness, owning up to what I say and what I do, being honest about what I didn't do. It starts with that. It goes into self-management, interpersonal. It's got a really solid list. Um, it says, basically, what does this look like? What does this look like? And what we've done with our kids some of us, not all, is we've provided a platform for them to succeed. We do all of the backup, all of the foundation that they're going to need. And that goes in simple issues, their laundry, their food, wake them up in the morning to those complex interpersonal issues of how to get along, how to organize my time so that I do connect, one of the number one ways for success for our kids is learn how to do appropriate and intentional and successful connections with others. We make it if we have good friends. I'm going to be fine today because I've known Krista forever. I've never had a, an interaction with Krista that hasn't been positive. Why am I worried? And I'm going to get to know Alex because I'm going to know who you are and meet you. How do I do that? Because the system, the program is going to do better when we have healthy connection. We supply all the support system for our kids to be successful. And what kids are going to need are their, their own ability to do those things. So the reason I love the book is I back it up. I, I go back and say, if kids, 
if, if students are coming to college less able to handle the entire situation of management of themselves, management of relationships, one of the things we talk about with our children is they need to make connections. That doesn't mean they have to be social because on the college scene, being social may bring up behaviors and activities that aren't going to work in their benefit. So how do you make connections so that we have good relationships, so we have a working situation? So what we want to do is begin with the exact list that he gives us and back up and say, how do I impart this to my children before they meet and uh, you know some sort of issue or difficulty and know how to handle it. We want them to be independent. Now, I always put a little sidebar here. If you raise your children successfully to be dependent, be aware that they may not be there later for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, the you may downside. be in the old folks home by yourself and they don't have time because you've done such a good job. So, you know, nothing is foolproof. Nothing is foolproof. So I, I think I just love the whole complexity of the book. And I just backtrack and say, okay, parents, when do we teach our kids to manage their time? Mm -hmm. Are you managing their time? Or are they learning how to manage their time? It's a simple concept. Because as I, I always mention to any audience, we're all too busy. I have found three-year-olds that are too busy. Mm -hmm. So if our culture is that we're valued for being busy, then this means you have to buy in somehow. You've got to create or buy in to how we're going to do this with our kids. So your next question is, Krista, how do you do this with your kids so that I can talk about the team meeting? <laughs> so ask me when we're going to do this, okay? Yeah, I, um, I just want to reiterate what I'm hearing from you, that teenagers today may have really excellent resumes, that they may have um, accomplished a lot of things, but they don't have the soft skills to back up the emotional crisis when it hits. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, and I really, I love the way you've summarized that. When we work with gifted children, these are kids that achieve. They get good grades. They're smart. And, and they're done well in school. They don't always remember that their social emotional skills are as important as their academic and achievement skills. So when I begin talking or counseling or working with a group of gifted adults or any age, you know, the human being from birth to death, I say social skills are how you get along with others. Emotional skills are how you get along with yourself. How do you work with yourself? Because gifted, if you've met a gifted child, you've met, or student, or adult, you've met a gifted person. They're all unique. And, they, and when, you, when I got to work with those able people, they were more different from each other than regular people. So I need to understand myself. Emotionally, how do I handle stress? Emotionally, how do I deal when I'm nervous and upset? And if I asked you now, how did I deal with that? You could give me a statement of that because from the time you've asked me to do this when I've never done it before to when we actually begin, I had a whole lot of needs that I had to work with emotionally with me. But I also need to work with the people I'm working with. That's social. And then I need to make sure the content's here. Does that make sense? And gifted human beings haven't separated that out. They don't realize. So when you begin to talk, you say, we want you to be competent and feel comfortable and a learner because when you're bright, you love to learn. Most kids do. How do you do that socially, emotionally, and academically? Does that help? So, so I always have a little bit of a response to soft skills. I think that my emotional ability is maybe as important as what I know and learn. They're all sort of, they're all sort of, to me, you know, just as important. But, and, go from there. So for a mom who's listening, if she's thinking, 
okay, I know where my child stands on their GPA and their SAT scores. I need to evaluate and help my child evaluate where they are on their social, emotional skill sets. How would you suggest they start? How would they start evaluating as a parent, as an observer? And then how do they bring that conversation to the young person that they're loving? <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect question. So one way to do this is to use the language. How do you feel about this test? Are you prepared for the information and, and, the, and the content? How do you feel about it? How do you feel about where you're taking it and what you're doing? You begin the language of those questions. So it's not just, are you prepared for the information? Are you prepared emotionally to do this? Are you prepared socially to do this? Are you ready to go in and take a three hour exam when you're a senior in high school? Are you prepared for a teacher to ask you questions? Are you ready? Can you do this? I find that it's really easy with your children to become a little imbalanced with that. You're more concerned about them emotionally maybe than you are about them socially than you are about academic. It's really a balance situation. If you're going to be competent in your life, you need to look at all three. Am I dealing with people I value? Am I, are, am I dealing with them effectively? Am I going to create the atmosphere that's going to be good? Am I handling my own emotions on this? See, am I handling me inside? And then do I know what I need to do? Do I know? when to do it one of the things one of the um strategies that we used with our kids we um we had a situation and and i've spread this i i just love to hear how this plays out with parents much of what i'm doing now is working with parent support groups so we had a meeting last week and and the the woman who's presenting with me marvelous presenter and she's in charge and she's we laid out our our program in front of us of what we were going to do we have quite a long time with them and a mother came in and sat down for the parent meeting. And she said, I'm sorry I'm late. My father died last night. And the emotion that it brings in me, I still have it. And everything in the group changed. He died of COVID. Um, she said, we're all Zooming. She's in a home where there are still people gathered. Her children are, they've bottomed out emotionally. And so we switched the content. The thing that was so great about it is she still came to the support meeting. See, there's still, in a busy world, we forget to take the time to do what we needed to do. We never got to the agenda. She called me the next day. She said, how'd I do? I said, you were, you were a better angel. You were awesome. Because she, number one, one of the skills with our kids as we raise them is to learn to listen. See, if we're too much in a hurry, we do a lot of telling and we know a lot. And if you have gifted children, you're gifted yourself. You have a lot to say. She listened to the group. She paid attention. Other people had things to say. She said, we have time for this because we meet every week. So I say within the family, when I learned about team meeting, I never forgot it. We need to have a team meeting. When our house burned to the ground, everybody lost everything. We were all emotionally so distracted and so consumed. Every week we got together and did a team meeting. And it started out with, what's going well? Which was a hard question. It went to, what's not going well what do we need to work on and the last so we left positive what are we going to work on individually and together next week say that's it's a team meeting nobody wanted to come the parent we didn't have time we had too much to do the kids had were so distracted we had people in and out we were living in a, a different place the team meeting with sacrosanct is that the is that correct sacrosanct in the family mm -hmm. it starts with a prayer it ends with a prayer what's going well start on a positive what isn't going well hit the meat of the situation 
What are we working on next week? Individually, what are you working on? Family, what are we working on? Then when the next week came, nobody wanted to come. I'm too busy. My daughter was a senior in high school. She was so busy. And I, I, then we're changing the time. Tell me the time. You can come. We'll work around you. This is expect. This is what we're doing. And then the skill of listening. Mm -hmm. It's just a real skill. I'm, I have to literally do this. Close, I just you're close, yeah, you're putting your hand over your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting my hand over my mouth. The gesture is, Margo, be quiet. Wait and listen. Let them talk. Mm -hmm. And the, along comes with that, when do your children talk? When does your spouse talk? You know, I love the mom who said, okay, I got it. I got it. I can do it. She came back the next week and she said, I took my daughter to lunch at the Davenport, the nicest hotel in town. I took her to lunch. It cost me $55. She didn't say a word. <laughs> Not a word. I, we, I, I asked questions. I did everything you taught me. We get home and at 11 o'clock at night, when I am exhausted, mm -hmm. mom, I got to tell you something. It's not only listening, it's honestly saying, when and where do they talk? Because mm -hmm. as you're raising them, five, seven year old, 10 year old, you, you want to listen, you got to find out when they'll talk to you. So these mm -hmm. are skills by having the team meeting and starting it early with the family, expectation, starting it early, doing some of these practices that help you. Um, and, and one of them that I learned with working with my children with difficult issues is the privacy of their room. Short of thinking they might have drugs and I need to go in and find out, I, ne I learned to never walk into their room. The team meeting is not in their room. It's a neutral spot. Knock. That's their private space. Um, may I come in? If it's no, where can we talk? It's beginning to learn those skills of, and those are, that is social, it's relational, but it's also emotional. Where am I going to get the best out of this? Not just academic, what do I want to accomplish here? These are so important in our culture. Our kids, our kids, birth to death, birth to death, are really concerned about this virus. Really concerned. And they need, they need to talk about it. They need to talk about it academically. What is it? Um, what, what's being done outside of politics? They need to talk about it within content, but they also need to talk about it socially and they need to talk about it emotionally. They're really concerned. And, and the older they get, as we begin with teenagers is they're talking with each other. They're not talking to us mm -hmm. unless we create the arena purposely and they know we mean it we have to mean it and do it yeah. you know um, it's interesting i i heard you saying um with that example you gave about the woman who took her daughter out to lunch and then she you know opened up later and i just don't want to miss that that we're often putting deposits in the love bank right and we don't get return on that all the time that we're constantly just intentionally, going back to your point about being intentional, we often are being intentional to spend that time, but what it's doing is it's laying the foundation so that at 10 o'clock at night, they feel close enough to us that they're willing to share. And so, you know, I just want to make sure that we're hearing that clearly that, you know, this is, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And if we want that social emotional interaction with our kids, it's going to take a lot of deposits in that bank before we may see anything come out of that. And I, and it's very different with your spiritual life, but it's also a bank. If we want our children to be spiritual, to have their faith, to find who they are really and where they need to be, we have to create the time and space that this is real, that it's real. They live with it and that's important. It's also important they have time to talk about it and feel it. We do pray at dinner. We pray together. We are at dinner together. I have families that they, aren't to, they don't eat dinner together anymore. 
they didn't, they don't know that they don't, they just don't, mm -hmm. they don't sit down to a dinner. So if there's, that's fine. Your family is what it is, but it's what's, what needs to be created is then when do we mm -hmm. acknowledge and practice it's practice. It's, it's a given. We do this. Um, one thing I loved as I was raising children was when I went to a session that talked about location. That the physical location, that's where I learned about knocking on the door to their room. And short of going, if you need to get in there, if something's wrong or you need to check, it's, that's their space, was beginning to build spaces where you do what you want to teach them. This was one of the greatest ones. You talk money, which is extremely important in our culture and in their lives. It's a content. Money is the content. And we need, to, we need to really address it socially and emotionally, okay? Money. So they suggested that you talk about money in one space. So it may be at a desk. It may be a place at the table. It may be, we, I, let's talk. We're talking money. It's a signal that says, this is so important in our family because a really good idea is you become financially responsible for your life. That'll be great. You know, so let's talk money. They need, and, and, and I've watched in one family, they talk, we divide our money between what we spend on what we need, what we spend on ourselves and what we save. They were very, it became a content in that family to purposely teach about money. Now, here's another place where in the book, talking about why freshmen fail is they don't know how to handle their money and they are suffering from the stress that their parents, and I don't want to say how much it costs to go to college for one year because I know I work in a college and some of these kids come home at, Thanksgiving and never go back. So now you've, I mean, money is an issue. K students, when I deal as a freshman advisor for years, worry about their parents and the expenditure of college. So let's back up. And I think about taking, I'm trying not to make this personal, it's almost impossible, taking those wonderful twin grandsons at three and four and five and six and saying, here's your money you've earned. Here's your money you get as an allowance. How much are you putting in the bank? It's so practical, but it's so true. It's skills they're gonna use for life. How much goes in the bank? How much are you gonna spend on something you've been wanting to buy or save for, okay? And what's the third one? You ask them, what's the third thing we're gonna do? Because money, is a skill and some families forget to teach the skill and then later there's an expectancy that you're going to support the children are you with me on this money's a good one food's another one it's a great place to say if if i can raise a child that can handle intake and decisions about food it's going to enhance their success because it's going to extend to what they drink what they buy, what they, uh, it just is, it becomes, it's content. And that's why the team meeting is a good, good place to start. So if we want independent children, we say, and adults at a very young end, they begin making their lunch. We talk mm -hmm. about the lunch at team meeting. Okay, it's the time that you're gonna make your lunch. So older child, the oldest in the family, mm -hmm. what have you learned about making lunches? Cause you wouldn't teach Timmy how to make his own lunch, okay? So what's in a lunch? How do we do it? When do we do it? These things are things that will build into them the success that when they get to college, we don't go pick them up to take them home at Thanksgiving and find wrappers. They haven't even been to dinner. They haven't gone to the, the dining hall. They're eating, they're eating whatever they can find. They're eating alone. They're not connecting. They're socially, are, are you with me? These skills need to start very young. That's why I love the book. Because it said, here's why kids are failing their freshman year. And let's back up and say, how can we help them? How can we teach them so that this doesn't happen? What I hear you saying a lot is um, 
age appropriate responsibility that you're giving kids incrementally more and more as they grow. And the example you used of not going into a teenager's bedroom kind of alerted me that as moms, we have to be mindful that we are also helping them age appropriately in the social emotional element. And that sometimes we don't want to let go. We want to, one, maybe do all those practical things for our kids so they don't learn the practical skills. But we also don't want to give them the space that is age appropriate uh, for them to know what it's like to be alone for four hours in a room so that they have that practice of when they're feeling lonely or when they're feeling sad, the mom isn't sweeping in to rescue them in those moments is maybe appropriately available, but is still um, working on growing those boundaries. And that I think moms just need to be real conscious of that. And, and it's going to be young and, and dads. dads. Yeah. But since most of our listeners are moms, that's why I'm saying that. Yeah. But just it, I think sometimes we are still thinking we have an eight year old when we have an 18 year old and we're dealing with letting go so that that 18 year old has enough space to practice spreading their wings a little bit that we can suffocate. Well said. I, I, I just wrote it down age appropriate. <laughs> Is the word that I should have used. Really, it's 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 so important, and and also some of that responsibility to the older for the younger, mm -hmm. you know, putting them in charge. I talked to a mom the other day, and she said we're going to somewhere this weekend. Eleven, we're going somewhere, and uh, the and the children will be home alone. I said what? I mean, her oldest are seventeen and eighteen. These are young adults. Her youngest are, you know, ten, eleven. Well, they're not, they're not babies. She said, they will do fine. They will do, this is a, this is a, a mom that's taken concerted effort to say, my children will write the Christmas letter. Really? I mean, Christy, you're the only person who's found the secret. I, I, I don't know anybody else who's done that. It's beginning to look at how, what could they do and what do they need to know to do it? And then how do I help? But I'm not doing it for them. And it's mm -hmm. age appropriate. It really is. And it's the elder taking care of the younger. I want those, those children that are older to go out and have families where the youngers are part of it. And they don't just come away from the family experiences, the firstborn or the middle or the youngest, which I always throw into every session that I teach in a group. Let's talk about why you're the way you are and what you need to step across. It's like working with children about the difference between being social. It's a team meeting topic. The difference between social and real connectedness. This is what we ran into with, with gifted kids that were over 12. They, they didn't know how to ask for help. They didn't know who to ask for help. They didn't know what to do when things went wrong. And they thought it was weak to ask for help. They don't see the adults in their family asking for help. It's unusual that in a competent family, someone goes to a counselor. If that is in your family, God bless you. Because you're teaching the people around you that you will take care of yourself and you will be intentional about that. So we found that far too many kids, it's always percentage, it's not everybody. Gifted kids are more different from each other than regular kids. We did find in too many kids, they didn't know how to ask for help. So if I go to my grandson now, who's a, just a great kid and extremely emotional, extremely emotional, wants to be in love. I say, you know, I just read something, you know, it's embedding the command. It's a skill, you embed the command. You either put it, you say, Krista told me because he values Krista, or you say, I just read, because he's too busy to say, where did you read it? You know, it's, it's, close, it's a little bit, it's a strategy, not lying. Okay, so I, I just read that when kids get to college, some of them really need emotional help. It's healthy. They get concerned, and they're, and they're scared, and they're anxious. And so when you go look at these colleges, you might ask them this, this 
this person was telling me that kids should ask, what's your counseling service? Is it available all night? Is it comfortable at this college to go see a counselor? Is it socially accepted to go see it? Are your counselors any good? You know, those are questions that are as important as, can I get my major? They are, they are that important. And the more, the brighter a youngster is, the more you need that. They're gonna run into, if they really get a good education, they should run into times they don't know what to do or they should have. I have kids who come, who came for freshman advising and would say, I'm going to major in, this is the, uh, actually, Krista knows this person, and if I told her who it was, she would not be able to not smile. She can't, this student came, it was education, she wanted to be a teacher, and she said, can I get my elementary and my secondary certificate during the time I'm here as an undergraduate? Well, of course you can, if you never go to bed. You, of course you could do that. Time-wise, it is impossible. You either gotta stay twice as long, or you have to not go to bed. It is impossible. Now, some gifted kids will look you straight in the eye and say, then I'm gonna do it. The, if it's impossible, I'm gonna do it. And that's when you have to give the license to say, if you come to college and you're gonna play a sport and you're gonna perform musically and you're going to get straight A's and you're gonna get a double major, be sure to know we have a really solid counseling program, okay? And I, my door is open, all, I stay up all night, but don't call me early in the morning. It, it, are you with me? It's that I mean, interaction it's, of raising kids when they're little and they want to do all, you, it, it's sitting down with a eight-year-old and saying, you have a lot on your plate. And then listen, do they know it? Are they aware of it? Can they talk about it? Do they have the language, the vocabulary, the understanding, or is it a question? I talk with you and I feel like you have too much on your plate. Let's talk about that next week. And then you do talk about it next week. Mm -hmm. I was even thinking. And that you know, relates whole... to the, the emotional part of it. That may be, that could be, I don't know. Is it why you're pretty emotional right now? It's, it's putting the questions forth and remembering to come back and, and check in. You know, it's teaching kids, that's called connection. Now, it does involve social. It means finding the people you can talk to. I, I really know mm -hmm. I could call Krista anytime she's awake and say, Krista, I've got a problem. Could you take a half an hour with me? And she would take that time. That's a social relationship, but it's also a connection. And we find that what our kids need in life our connection, who to talk to with connection. And they need to formulate that when they go to college. It's a little hard when they're going to college and I'm gonna be very concise here and they live in a plexiglass situation in the dorm, when they're eating and when they go to class. So if we, we, what we have to do is we have to back up and say, okay, let's talk about how do we connect? because connection is going to make all the difference. That apparently is what makes the difference with whether you are good as a worker or a student or a friend, is that it, you also have the connection. It's such great stuff. You know, kids can, uh, really bright kids often know this. You just have to bring it to the surface. Are we on the right about, topic? So I, was, I was thinking about self-efficacy when you were talking because um when in just as a coaching technique you know that's one thing that we do as life coaches is we help people with self-efficacy and that is that following up with that question you know and really praising the hard work not the result not oh you're so smart you know i was actually just watching a ted talk about how we the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset and how we often praise in such a way that reinforces a fixed mindset by saying, oh, you're so smart at this. 
oh, the reason you're good at this is because you're so gifted at it. Instead of saying, wow, I really admire your hard work, which is more of the growth mindset praise. And so I was even thinking of those two things like, okay, we can really lean into growth mindset and help teach our kids that even with the praise we're giving as parents. Mm -hmm. And then that powerful questioning of following up with them a week later and saying, Hey, how's that going? How's that going? Mm -hmm. Working on that project. You have been working so hard. So, you know, that, that, and allowing them to really name what it is that they're growing in and how they can name what it is that they've done because that's the self-efficacy piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the baseline is the mind, the brain is happier when it's changing and growing. Len's reading the book Beginners right now, and it talks about birth to death, forcing yourself to learn new things because the brain is better if it's learning. And it's just, it's a great book. All the things that this author, of course, did to write the book, showing these learning, but the, but the concepts behind it are Usually what I want to do as a person who's busy and dominating and talk too much, I want to tell them. I want to tell them what they need to know for their own good. Isn't it better to stop and say, what did you learn? And the, and the reason I'm asking you that is because the brain is a learning organism. It, it changes all the time. And the brighter you are, the more it loves to learn. To learn, you need two things. A difficult situation and hard work. And you need someone, a connection. You, know, you begin to learn the language. God provides you. And those connections are unbelievable. I'm always saying, okay, God, you did it. I'm sorry. I'm stopping and saying how much I appreciated you created a miracle. And this is what I've learned. Because that's the question we want to ask each other. When it didn't work and when it does work, what, what did you learn? Because that's when we're going to grow in our faith, our relationships, and who we are. Is if we continue to find difficult situations, put in the work, and sometimes we don't make it. The value isn't in making it. It's in, what did you learn? I learned we're not getting another dog. Two dogs in this family is too many. We thought it was a great idea. Chandler doesn't behave, and he has messed up the other two animals. His sister, Stuart the cat, is unbearable, and Leo has become a muckleish when he was supposed to teach Chandler how to behave. So what I've learned is one dog at a time, don't, don't, don't overlap the dogs until one is on its deathbed. Then bring the new one really fast and let Leo teach him what he knows and then move the one in. Are you with me? I mean, it's, it's, it's so logical. We don't, we forget to ask that question at three when they start talking and doggone it. These little gifted kids are talking at two and three. They are. And they're telling you what to do and how to do it. There are some gifted kids that'll blow you away. What'd you learn? What did you learn? Your brain loves to learn all three areas. Emotionally, socially, and academically. And in families that are very bright, the parents are very bright, the kids are very bright, the dog is very bright, everybody's so bright, they forget about how important the social emotional is. It is really important. Uh, my, my grand dog and I have an emotional relationship. And, and when I don't get to walk him anymore for the reasons I'm just not emotionally the same when I'm not around him. Does that make sense? Emotional growth or need, there's so many places that we need it. We need it. Emotional understanding. Because our kids can crash and burn. They can. And, um, and, and then you throw in a fact and you say, of course, not in your situation, but more Grown-up kids at 18 are coming to their freshman year, either having been with a counselor all the time, or they're on medication, or they have issues that have been unresolved. And these, that does not help when you're trying to do difficult work and deal with social 
lots of our very gifted kids are asocial. They, they're, they don't know how to make relationships. So we say you have to connect. So they look around at what's social. And if they don't, that's why I love the skills in this book. If they don't have the ability to stop and say, I've got to make decisions here about my time. I'm on social media to get my friendships. I'm going back to, you know, so see, having this whole issue of screen time and social platforms has really made parenting hard. It was hard already. Um, it's really made parenting hard. So if we don't start those questions and what'd you learn and how does this work and what are you really doing and where's and time management, if we don't start that young, they go to college and they don't know what to do about it. But we were told when I was advising, we were told that the strongest addiction with our kids, now this is a small Christian college, which I adore, which I adore. The hardest issue is they're addicted to the computer, not to drugs, not to to um, substance abuse, the computer. They don't know when to turn the computer off. And so when they have to turn in their assignment, they try to stop in the middle of their essay, they stop, then they go use the computer and they come in, come back and they go on. And as a professor, you can tell them where that was, you can mark it. You are on the computer here and here and here. Screen That's time and this whole technology issue is, is worth, all we can learn and develop and model. You know, I, I know all the time parents are on their computer looking at their kids saying, don't use screen time. How smart do you have to be? And then, and then the, the child will say, are you doing your work or are you, are you on social media? I mean, it's, it is, we're going to have to really, we're going to have to really deal with this. If we want adults who grow up and make good decisions about family time and relational time and, and uh, having connections as well as social, we've got some real, we've got real issues to deal with here. Yeah. Thank you, Margo. This is all such rich content. I feel like literally we could sit here for hours and just talk about this, but do you have any last words of encouragement for parents today? You could have told me you're going to ask me that, Krista. It's not in my notes. I didn't put summary important information. Um, I think I think it's what we've been talking about. I think women and men um, need to have healthy connections, and I think we're going to have to take time to learn more about working with our children and working with each other and working with connections outside the family. It is, it is a cultural trend in our country that it is, it's great if you're busy. That's what we have chosen to do. And we aren't as careful about saying, my brain is a learner, and I need to be learning my life socially so that that's there, that I am dealing with my emotional issues and I'm open to share that and learn about it. We're not, we need to step back with people we trust and say, what do I, what do I need to be paying attention to? Because when you value being busy more than you value my faith, I mean, it's what you deal with all the time. My, my connectedness, my faith, who I am, to what I'm eating and how I'm exercising and how I treat people and how I'm taking care of the elderly who are many of them, not all, left alone because everyone's so independent and busy, you know? And we're yeah. losing people in a culture, we're losing people. I, I think we have to stop and ask good questions and talk to other women and include the men. I think we have to include the men. I, I, when I got up this morning, I thought I handed Lynn all my materials. That's hard to do, uh, to say, I know, I know you're busy even where we are in our life. Would you take a look at this? Am I on the right track? How about the brooch? He said, I don't know what a brooch is. Well, 
did you notice I was wearing something that you were looking at instead of my eyes and into my soul? He said, yeah, you got something on your lapel. Did you, is that, do you want that? You know, so my final remark is, I'm so glad for what you're doing. If we're paying attention to each other, eye contact, touch, and time is all a child really wants. Eye contact, touch, and time. That's great. Not somebody telling them what to do or doing mm -hmm. it for them. This needs to be done. Am I accurate? Does it need to be done? When is it due? What can I help? But what are you going to do? Eye contact, touch, and time. It's the key. And then really good. That's books. great. And then sessions yeah. like this. And then lots of money and new clothes and time to go to lunch and somewhere where we can go. Could we get this thing cleaned up so we can at least go to lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, Margo, you were a delight. I'm so thankful for your voice in many, many worlds that you speak into, including mine and my, my son's life. And, you know, as the grandmother of two of my son's best friends, um, you've been a real and voice. Your daughter, <sighs> your daughter. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Do I have such dreams about her? I've been so careful not to tell her what she should be doing for her own good. <laughs> I haven't done it once, but I, oh my gosh, what a joy she is. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, thank you, Margo, so much. And we really appreciate just the, the things you shared today. Really important for parents. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much fun. Okay. Bye. Bye.